Heidi, welcome to the Customer Experience Podcast. It's great to have you as my guest today. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you, Emma. It's uh, good to be here. Thank you. So our topic today um, is kind of close to my heart and it's centered around, you know, as a leader, how you successfully approach digitalization um, in the retail industry. Um, and you're currently working as retail director at WH Smith, um, you know, the oldest retailer in history, over 200 years you know, old, um, and a true heritage brand that goes back centuries in terms of the trusted products and experiences that it has created for its customers. So, um, so kudos, kudos to you working for such an iconic brand. So let's start off, Heidi, with a bit of an introduction for our listeners. Just tell us a bit about yourself and your experience and, and you know, how you've supported digitalization as a leader. OK, um, well, I've been in retail now for 38 years which um, is, is incredible, really. So I've had the full experience from um, many years before there was any suggestion of digitalization or online shopping. Um, I've been fortunate to work for some incredible retailers, food, um, both Asda and Tesco's, Ikea, um, Kingfisher, and of course, WH Smith. So... I've really seen the transition of how customers have changed their shopping habits um, over the last 30 plus years. Um, and I suppose having been immersed in retail for all those years, you naturally evolve with the changes and what the customer needs are. So it's been a, a real interesting experience for me. And I, I was fortunate that um, I, I was still very much in the infancy of my leadership when we started to be introduced um, within retail with uh, online and the whole digital experience. So I was very open for that level of change um, and, and have continued to, to evolve with it since. That's quite a lot of experience in the sector um, and some great brands in there. So as you say, change, you know, you, you've kind of been open to it, but change has been essential. I mean, if we think about the demise of the high street and all of, you know, the great brands that are sadly no longer with us, you know, it'd be great to share with the listeners from, from your experience across all of those organisations, really, how, how you as a leader have gone about reinventing the store of the future. Um, and embracing digitalization, bringing some of those kind of, you know, stories to life? Um, first of all, I think that it, it's, it's about having confidence that actually there will always be a need for the high street, even with the evolution of, of online, um, and just being able to remain relevant to the customer and be able to offer the full end-to-end -end experience. I think for any retailer, that's really important. It's making sure you get your offer right. Um, so essentially you've got to know who your customer is and more importantly, who they're not. Um, and, and then approaching the way in which you um, offer. So what the product is, what your message is in terms of you know, is it about uh, variability or, or the different products you sell or the services you provide, or is it value? And it's just being able to adapt to what that customer need is and be, be able to survive in a digital world that we're in today. Uh, I think there's always going to, to be a need for that physical experience as well as the online experience. It's just making sure that you can um partner um you know both those different types of customer needs yeah totally agree um and i suppose we've seen much more around brands choosing the stores for the experiential side of the the business and getting to know the brand just through immersion uh, immersion within the mm. stores you talked there Heidi about you know one of the essential components is about knowing who your customers are can you talk to me about you know your experience about you know how you've gone about 
truly understanding your customers over those 38 years of experience? Yeah, I think it's essential to um, get feedback from your customers. Now, that's evolved and changed over the years. You know, when I was first in retail, your only method of um, two-way conversation was, was actually um, asking, canvassing for opinion through surveys whilst people were in stores and, you know, God, I feel old, but um, paper form and people ticking boxes of um, what they liked, what they didn't like. And actually... That, is, that has changed to something much more sophisticated where uh, the customers, when they're in store, can easily um, answer questions that will be on a system or where you're going out and you're asking customers to return feedback um, when they've made a purchase via their receipts. So uh, we've, we've canvassed or I've canvassed um, customer opinion in so many different methods. I still think that um, you can't underestimate the whole feeling that you get in a store with your customer. So you, you, you really do get to feel what that customer um, feels about the environment, how they feel about the colleague that is serving them, um, yeah, whether it's convenient, whether it's not, whether you've got the product they need, whether, whether they haven't. So I never move away from some of those old methods. I think it's just really important to, to use every um, method of communication that you can, um, but to never not listen. I, I think when you start to make assumptions around what your customer needs are based only on maybe what they purchase, you could be missing actually um, what else they they could possibly need so it, it's it's throwing the net out but being really conscious around what is it that you're seeking to understand um so I, i've continued to do that and will continue um to do that to try and be able to 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 meet those needs yeah and you talked earlier about partnership between physical and digital. So, you know, how have you approached creating that partnership, you know, for, for the retail estates that you've been responsible for and ensuring both from a customer perspective, but also a colleague perspective, that that partnership is, is, is real and tangible? Yeah. Uh, and this, I think, is, has always been a challenge, really, because I think, everyone is unique in their experience and their needs are, are very different. And you have your customer today that will shop in every, um, every method. So it might be that, that they'll be in the store and actually then they are looking at um, online on their own telephone, um, researching to see actually where the value is, is it? best to shop with you there and then or actually could they get a better offer online or in another retailer so it's being able to adapt to to support that I know that when I shop quite often um, before even entering um, a, a store and being physical in a store I'm looking online I'm already consciously looking at the purchase that um you know, the purchase that, that I want to get, I, I want to be inspired. So I want to have an understanding before actually going into a store or, or deciding to buy online, um, you know, what, what, what that is. And uh, I think being able to meet both needs, so having a online presence where you can offer that inspiration, you can also give all the information around the availability of a product where you're able to offer um, a next day delivery or um, a delivery within the required time or the customer to ca can come in immediately into the store, I think is essential. Um, and I think there is retail retailers out there that do an outstanding job of that. And I, I think that, you know, for... For many other retailers are still on that journey of understanding how everything links together and making sure that you've got synergy with both platforms 
um, because otherwise you can confuse your customer. Uh, and what you don't want to do is, is really just appeal to one type of customer for in-store and one type of customer um, online. You want to be able to appeal to, 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 to the many, um, to both. Yeah. And, you know, great example there of kind of how the, the mobile kind of um, device and how we, you know, carry that everywhere with us allows us to, you know, self-help a little around that seamlessness around you're going into a store, but actually you're being inspired by this kind of digital asset that you're carrying around with you. What about the, the I guess, you know, you've got so much experience, you know, in the bricks and mortar side of things. How have you had to, as a leader, really kind of take, um, or how have you gone about rather, taking the, the colleagues in the store on this digital journey? Yeah. You know, because ultimately technology is coming into the physical side of the store, maybe, you know, kind of changing the way that they had to do things and serve customers previously. So talk to me about the, the change journey that you've led for your people on the ground through this digitalization. Yeah, uh, and it's a great question. Uh, and I think that um, it's a big responsibility as a leader to be able to support um, and encourage your colleagues to be able to take these steps. It can be very daunting, especially if you're in an organisation, and I've worked for many, where you have longevity. So you have colleagues which you're incredibly proud to have retained, um, but, but actually can be quite fearful of change, um, especially some of um, your older colleagues that may not feel so comfortable with technology. I think, first of all, the most important thing of a, as a leader is, is treat your colleagues as equals, treat them as adults, explaining um, the reason why you are approaching a piece of change, whether it's digital or whether it's something else, but, but really getting your team to appreciate the necessity for that change. Why is it important for us as an organisation to go on that journey? Um, and why is it important um, for the colleagues to be able to engage with that and also be open to all of the new expectations around what, what is their purpose. Uh, and I think when you explain um, the necessity, and essentially what, what you're explaining is that for the health of your long-term business, it is an absolute um, necessity to, to do that. The majority of, of your people will go with you on that journey. They'll be less afraid. They will be open to all of the development and training that's necessary. And that would then be the next step. You, you've got to equip your people to be able to have the confidence with anything that's new within any business, not just retail, it's, it's anywhere. And, and I'm sure that you, you will appreciate that in your career. You've You've got to invest that time. You've got to ensure that you are placing an arm around every individual um, to help them to, to really get to that point where they have a belief in themselves that they're able to, to do that. So that, that whole explanation, change of purpose, um, training development, and then celebration really when you've made a transition and you're beginning to reap the benefits as an individual or as a business um, I, I think that that really is all you need to do um, I don't think it's too complicated but it's not easy it essentially you're going through a continuous cultural change um, that we all have to face as as leaders um, and and that's how I've always approached it, and it's it's always really benefited me um, as a leader. I've had great success. It's probably um, it's probably been some of the best highlights that I've had with my career, going through big change management programs, and predominantly a lot of that has been around evolution and what 
the customer um, needs are or what those changes are. So you're not someone that shies away from change then, which as a no. leader is really, really positive. Absolutely. And there's a lot in there, a lot of nuggets. And, and as you say, it's it's not complicated, but I, equally, it's not easy because if it was, then, you know, we wouldn't see change um, fail and organizations yeah. go through through, you know, kind of. In not the happy path that you describe in, in your career. So let's unpack some of that then. So you talked about um, training um, and making sure that people felt that they had the skills and have evolved through the change. You know, what's what's the biggest um, changes to skills um, that you've seen as a result of digitalization? Um, I, I think just just being able to understand the whole technical journey to start with so how do you physically support your customers with um, your online presence or when you're in store when a customer may not be able to get what they need in the moment but you've got to be able to offer them um, another way of, of getting that that product and it sounds really simple but when you've had colleagues that have worked for many years and just worked physically on a teal when it's one the only method of communication or, or technology that they've ever had to use just helping them um not just from a how to work a computer or how to work an ordering system um but also how to offer that product because what i have found um certainly in other organizations that i've been in when we were first introducing um being able to order online in store, as an example, that the product wouldn't be available and the conversation would end there. That what the colleague didn't um, link or appreciate was how to um, ensure that they did the best to convert that customer to online because it, customers have had to also go through this change, which can be really daunting and would go from one shop to another shop to another shop to maybe get the product that they wanted rather than actually appreciating that they, they don't really need to go anywhere else then in fact that they can enter small stores with maybe limited um SKUs and availability but in fact can order anything from the whole catalog of whatever that retailer is offering um, and can get it conveniently quite quickly. So it, it, it's been it, it's been the whole physical technical um, development that's been needed. Apologies, that's my clock in the back. You might want to edit that. Um, it, it's been it's been not just the physical piece, but also the whole conversation that needs to take place in in store. Fantastic, you know, all really, really helpful kind of insights for the listeners. I wanted to go back to um, your point around, you know, the kind of change of purpose. Um, mm -hmm. So what would you say has been, you know, serving customers in store where you've got all of this digitalization around you? Um, whether that's kind of media screens, technology in store, or just the connectivity to the online through your mobile, as you as you described, what how have you approached? You know, what is what has changed about the purpose of that store colleague? What's different? What are they? What what is their purpose in us in a physical store now that digitalization is so big? Well, I, I think it's it's really interesting because I actually see the purpose of a colleague in store almost doing um, full circle because I think now it's so much more around the relationship with the customer and the conversation in the moment. Now, if I, I think back to 38 years ago when I was first in retail, it was very much that, um, selling furniture and non-food products at the time. So it was much more of a selling culture um, I think today it's those conversations are as relevant um, and it's more around the offering of services that you might have in the store. It's um, the colleague being able to um, make suggestions to the customer, being able to offer 
alternatives um, really to seek to understand what the customer need is um, and how they can fulfill that. So I think the relationship between the colleague and customer has never been more important. I think it is a really difficult age to grow loyalty with your customer. And ultimately, retail today, having the online presence, really, what do you offer as a retailer that's any different to any other retailer? Um, and outside of services, um, products, generally, you're going to be able to per buy anywhere, purchase anywhere. But actually, that whole experience with a colleague and connecting, um, I think that purpose is more critical today um, than, than ever before. Yeah, I agree. And, and I guess, you know, as, as a kind of just a shopper myself, when you go into stores, I think where you know, you've seen that there's been a cut back and there's not that many people on the shop floor. Um, you know, you it, it's 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 not a great experience at all because actually you've got much more intent now about going into a physical shop. You've gone, you've you've purposely gone in there, whereas you know, before you know, brands had you know the, the digital capability online, you had no other option and no other outlet. So it and, and I do feel like that now. When I go in, I suppose my expectation as a consumer has definitely increased because it's like, no, I really wanted to go into this store today. I'm really looking for something. I'm really wanting to ask a question, I really wanted to engage in something I've seen online. So actually you're right you know just that knowing that there is a store colleague around and, and and having that warm welcome when you walk in you know on reflection to your point is is actually more important than it than it was yeah. before really yeah I, I completely agree and you know we have to be realistic all retailers today um have to be working to a cost-effective model that there, there is no option um and again, it's all about the longevity and the health of, of all of these businesses. It's absolutely key. You've got to be commercially viable. Um, so I think it is more challenging for a customer to go into a store and automatically get the attention, if you like, of, of a colleague. It, it might not be possible in the moment. They might be busy with task and activity or with another customer. However, however, it is all about manners, I think. Um, it's all about um, colleagues not ignoring customers, even if they're unable to serve them at the time. It, it's, it's showing care and consideration and acknowledging a customer. I think the majority of customers are really reasonable and they really appreciate um, what... Um, what business is like today and how challenging it is, especially after the pandemic, after the last two years. However, I think that customers are less forgiving of um, not being recognised, not um, being attended to when they can clearly see there is an opportunity for that colleague to do that. And as a leader, um, I think that it is our responsibility to absolutely ensure you you cultivate a culture where our, our colleagues care about the customer. So even if we have um, challenges with resource, that should never um, compromise caring uh, and doing your best for the customer in the moment, whatever that customer needs. So glad you said that, Manners. Um, that really resonated with me, I guess, in terms of my experience, um, you know, leading customer teams in a retail environment as well. It's, you know, it is about those brilliant basics. It is around, you know, if, if you're in a store and you're there to serve customers, then, you know, kind of make them feel welcome, you know, and just having that awareness of them being in store and not being too busy tasking to, to notice them. Yeah. Um, and actually, it's one of those in a, in a digital age, you know, I think about teams I've led where all of the interactions were digital. And actually, you know, 
some people that haven't had the experience of maybe some of the, the service element of, you know, that frontline experience, um, you know, might find it harder to know how to care for mm. a customer in a physical environment unless they've worked in, you know, an industry that has allowed them to have, have that exposure, really. And I think that's probably another opportunity is about, you know, recognising the experience that people have had before they join your organization and have they had that kind of cold face frontline soft skills I, to use the word soft skills but that kind of to yeah. your point the manners yeah. the etiquette you know those those kind yeah. of um, simple but really important skills that make the difference between a customer potentially wanting to come back into that physical environment again or not really yeah uh, absolutely uh, and also you, and you you touched on it having the right people is is key you know if if you do not have individuals that are able to connect with other humans and want to do a good job even if they're restricted in doing the best that they want to do but 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 actually wanting to do a good job um i, I think it is absolutely critical if you if you have a poor culture, if you have low engagement, if you're not treating your colleagues with the level of respect, all of those things will ultimately impact on the customer's experience. Um, and that has never changed with or without digital. That, that has always, for me, been one of the biggest responsibilities that I have as a leader. Um, creating that environment where people can be the best um, of themselves it is key. And it doesn't mean that it's easy. It's always been hard in retail. It's growing harder, which actually means that we have to work so much um, harder with communication and engagement, purpose, clear, so Heidi, you've articulately shared how you've taken you know, your team as a leader through the change curve um, earlier on to the listeners. Can you just bring to life a little bit more about how, uh, through your leadership, you've taken the customers on that change you know, cycle as well? Taking the customer along with you, I think there's, there's several different um, ways that we do that and all businesses do that. One through the conversation with the colleague um, and the colleague being able to support the customer through that experience journey. And we've spoken about that, um, but also how you set your stores up differently. You, you've got a customer that um, will be coming in and very much it's about self-selection limited connection don't want connection just want to be able to get the product um, and purchase it and leave so you've got to make sure that your stores are set up correctly so navigation for example is really really important and actually the journey starts before they come through the front door so that's from all your marketing in the window so the customer is um, is aware of what the offer is um, uh, and then when they get in, being able to get to that category, whatever their purchase need is, really quickly, swiftly, making sure that you've got all of your brilliant basics right in your store. So the customer doesn't, if they don't want to, interact with a colleague. How then you have a self-serve kiosk, for example, which, you know, I've been through um, the first time they were introduced to when a lot of retailers were taking them back out because they didn't, the customer didn't like them to be reintroduced again. Um, and so it's been able to simplify that whole experience for the, for the customer and, of course, have the colleague on hand if necessary. And then, of course, your whole online present. So ensuring that um, you're making it as easy for the customer to shop for themselves online you know what that looks like your front page being really clear easy to navigate as limited clicks as possible um 
being able to offer what whatever the customer needs from a delivery point of view when they get it where to whether they want it to collect it um and then the whole inspiration piece of you know if if you've got a a, a customer that at the moment if i talk stationary they're buying for your children going back to school how you make sure that you're able able to offer the full suite of options and what that child will need going back into um, going back into school. So it's educating the customer verbally, physically when they're in store, uh, and of course online. Yeah, and you talked earlier, Heidi, about you know needing to be relevant and appeal to multiple customers. And you know, the, the example you gave there is, is a back to school. And I'm imagining, you know, within you know the sector and the companies you've worked with, there's been all different types of segments that you've needed to serve really. How um, you know, how have you and your team really kind of set yourselves up to be able to kind of really distinguish between those different customers and then intentionally work through what those kind of customer journeys look and feel like within you know the retail environment that you're responsible for yeah i think i think for me um all of the retailers i've ever worked for really you're just appealing to the whole life cycle of a customer you're appealing to families so working in food very much family working in non food um, and the home very much family no different with with what i'm i'm doing today so it's being able to appeal to the ages uh, and again you know without overcomplicating your offer just really homing in on those that are most relevant to to, to you so you know being specific um I, I think is is quite challenging it's dependent on where you're working at the time but if i look back at ikea um as a really good example which is the full life cycle however your your customer is really concentrated by with your first homeowners so you've got, you have got an age group there, which will be your dominant customer. So keeping those in mind, making sure you've got the right level of innovation, considering that when they're coming into a store or even when they're going online, they're likely to have children, very young children. How do you make sure that you are able to connect with um, with them so if they're coming into the store I'm sure you've visited an Ikea about how you make that experience fun how you have the offer of you know being able to have your breakfast lunch or dinner while you're there the whole kids area play area um, and when you're online if you look at the method in which they attract their customer on every page you will have something that really calls you if you're um, a young family you'll have something that that will be for the child or even intimating that child friendly so again it's just appreciating what what is your dominant customer and how you um, promote yourself um, how you primary promote yourself to, to that particular age group yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it makes sense. And I suppose, you know, I guess, you know, my experience working with customer segmentation is, you know, you've got that thread of what unites all of your customers. And then yeah. you've got, you've got, you know, the kind of more limiting differentiators then. And actually, you know, you're right as a brand, if, you know, you focus the energy on, on, on what unites them and that's the thread, you know, then you don't move away from your brand values either. So it then simplifies it, makes it less complicated, but you've got an awareness of the, the different segments that sit around it, but actually, you know, you know that your heartland is what you're looking to, to kind of communicate to throughout those customer yeah. journeys makes, makes total sense. And, and I do think that that sometimes is sometimes where retailers go wrong. So 
again, I, I, I will um, just use IKEA as an example. What I think is great about that brand is they know absolutely who they are um, and more importantly, who they're not. So what they offer predominantly is inspiration, innovation and value. That, that's the two biggest, um, the, the most important things that they offer. What they're not offering you is a seamless journey when you get through walk through a front door you've actually got a really long journey navigating to go through every single area to experience every single um, room within your home they even get you to pick your own stock out of a warehouse and then quite often you're queuing for a disproportionate amount of time but because they're not offering you that polished experience because they're not telling you that actually you're going to get have a seamless journey you don't expect it as a customer absolutely Heidi you're right um and if you know if you think about it I, I know lots of people as well that are intentional about going to to Ikea so you know the way that you rightly described it there it sounds like to some people hell I guess in terms of an experience but actually you know um, it's very clever what they've done um, and it has created a bit of theatre I think within retail um, for some customers to just want to go in and immerse themselves and you know spend certainly on a on a wet weekend you know a whole morning or a whole afternoon grazing around Ikea and you forget about the pain of the self-assembly at the end of it all so um, <laughs> so good points <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I think, you know, you've talked a lot about the change that you've been involved in and led and, you know, kind of not averse to, to lead in that change. You've got a tried and tested method that, you know, has been successful for you that you've shared with listeners. What are the greatest obstacles that you've had to overcome as a leader within this kind of digitalization in retail? Um, and how have you overcome it? I think some of the biggest challenges is just looking at how you're going to navigate through um, a continuous change and, and also as customers are becoming more confident with online shopping, how do you make your presence um, in store, in a physical store, still relevant and still necessary? You know, we don't want to be in a world where actually uh, physical stores don't exist anymore. We want to be able to have uh, an offer that is going to attract customers to come out as well as shop online. And it's not restricting either. So it's how do we make the business incremental rather than transferable? So um, that I think is one of the biggest challenges that we all face um, and, and not going all for one particular method and um, way of, of, of shopping versus the other. How do you marry the two together um, and, and not have an unintended consequence um, on on either of either either of those methods, that I think is still and continues to be a challenge. And I'm sure with every year um, and the speed of change, we will get to a point where we recognise that this is the the um, direction that we we need to go. I say we, as in all retailers. Um, but I, I think being really acutely aware that this is rapid, this is an, the, the way in which change is happening today um, is, is just accelerating. Being able to keep up with that, uh, I think, is, is something that every business um, has to work incredibly hard on. Yeah, absolutely. And it's getting that balance, isn't it? And it's been led by the consumer. So it's making sure to your point right at the start, you know, you really know your customers 
um, well, because ultimately, you know, as, as a business, the evolution around how you serve them should be based around what your consumer wants and, and how your consumer is changing, you know, um, and is influenced and what those consumer yeah. needs are. So, as you said at the start, you know, continuously asking for feedback, continuously not you know, being complacent and not kind of making any assumptions. I think all of those earlier points, you know, would, would would support addressing and ensuring that, you know, you don't end up being the, the next kind of casualty on the high street, really. And, and, it, um, and it's being able to, it's being able to continue to attract new customers, um, but equally, I knew that was going to happen. Well, and and equally, it's being able to be a business that can continue to attract new customers, um, but not at the expense of those customers that um, have always shopped with you and are loyal um, to you. It's being able to um, offer um, an experience and a service to both uh, and making sure you protect your heritage as, um, as a retailer. Agreed, absolutely. So my last question for the listeners then, I just wondered, Heidi, you know, to close, what are your kind of key future predictions for customer experience um, within retail in the next five years? So my my predictions, um, obviously online will continue to evolve, grow. Um, I think it would be really exciting. Um uh, what will be on offer. Uh, I think the speed in which people will be able to get their needs, whatever their need is in the moment, it is, is, is just, is, it's just going to continue to grow arms and legs. I, I, I'm not sure at what point it will be capped, really. Um, however, I, I think there will always be a need for a, a physical presence, a physical store. Um, and I think that experience will... Um, obviously change I think we will become um, cashless in retail Um, I think that the um, store experience will change and more services will be on offer so as well as being able to purchase product um, be able to um, get a service in, in a store whatever that will look like I know currently we've got post offices as as an example um, but I, I think under one roof you will be able to maybe buy your sandwich get your paper post a parcel um, get your hair done get your nails done um, buy a pet who knows um, <laughs> Uh, I think it's um, it's going to be a really interesting five to ten years. Yeah, absolutely. And brands like Anya Heinmarsh, um, you know, have kind of set up their own little villages in parts of London where you can do maybe not buy your pet, but you could certainly do a lot of those things from, you know, going for tea and coffee to buying a really you know, nice handbag to get in your hair and nails done and just, you know, almost immersing people around the brand, but partnering with with other organisations to to make the the purpose of going into town and into the shopping centres worthwhile, really, in an experience. So, Heidi, thanks so much for sharing all of your, you know, enormous experience um, in leadership and retail with our listeners today. There's a lot of takeaway. So, Thank you. It's been lovely having you as my guest. Thank you, Emma.